Sure. Remind remind me what we're um it's just you and I chatting for a little bit. Um how long did you need to talk? Um well probably only about uh seven or eight minutes of this will go into the project. Right. But in order to cover all the ground I want to, maybe twenty five minutes or so. That's fine. That, I just okay wanted to you? understand the timing. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. Okay. That's that's no problem at all. Where are you all calling right, from? Right. Uh, I'm in Austin, I'm in Austin right, now. right now. Oh, Austin. Okay. Are you at UT or what? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm at UT. Okay. What do you study in there? Uh, well, I have a double major with computer science and history. So oh, cool. Uh, cool. this goes into the computer science uh, degree, one of the courses there. Uh, and then the history degree was sort of uh, just added in lieu of taking elective courses. Are you involved with the uh, those libertarian groups there, or the Austrian groups, or any of those groups um, at UT? To some degree, uh, I have some scheduling conflicts with that this semester. <coughs> but gotcha. I'm in, I'm involved in the libertarian Longhorns to an extent, and uh, I've been to a couple of the Mises Circle events on mm -hmm. campus. Isn't there a uh, Liberty on the Rocks group there? I don't know. There's one in Houston. I don't know if it's there um, yet. There may be. I, I don't know of it. Do you know Norman Horn? Uh, I do know him, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's a good he's a piece of friend of mine. He's a good yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't had uh, too much of a chance to interact with him since he's uh, – uh, he, he, since I got here, he hasn't been around as much. Uh, right, right. But it, from talking to him, he seemed like a very nice, knowledgeable person. Yeah. All right, so what's this computer science course that we're doing this for? What's the, uh, um, what's the well, course? And what's... Uh, the name of the course is Contemporary Issues in Computer Science. Oh, got and, it. Okay. Uh, there's a section on intellectual property as part right. of the course. Um, okay. So okay. this assignment uh, is not necessarily focused on uh, intellectual property within software and, and within mm -hmm. Uh, the tech world, although a lot of the way it's being covered in the course is. But this is more just uh, sort of what is it and uh, what have the effects been of these laws and of okay. having this notion of intellectual property. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. All right. So this should be recording. And um, I guess uh, we'll jump right in then. Sure. Uh, okay. So let's just start out. Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling me, what is property? How how would you describe property? Well, so I actually – this is something I've been focusing on in recent uh, months. Um, I think actually the, the, the very concept of property, the word property is, is often misused or used in a, a misleading way. Um, so the way you just asked it is probably the contemporary way um, of identifying ownable things – and you call them property. So like you say, what's your property like? So that car is your property. Um, I think that's potentially misleading. I, I don't mind using it. I use it myself sometimes. It's potentially misleading because the idea of property is just a characteristic, right? It's a feature of something. And it was originally used to refer more to the property right between the human actor, the human being, the owner, and something that he has the right under the law. To control a legal right to control some resource so really the way i think of it is property rights or ownership relations between human beings and certain resources as recognized by other human beings in society which is why it's a law or a legal institution um the word property is used ambiguously sometimes to refer to the thing that's owned and sometimes to refer to the relationship between the person and the thing but if you're like a scientist describing the, the nature of an entity or a feature of reality, you might talk about its properties right, or its features or its characteristics. And I think that's originally how property was used. The idea was that we observe that human beings um, act. We, we move around the world. We do things. We have purposes. We have ends. We have aims and goals, and we do certain actions. We perform certain actions to achieve these ends or goals. Um, the actions we perform are an attempt to apply our knowledge of the way the world works combined with the things we can physically actually control to change the course of events to achieve our ends. Okay, So okay. the entire idea of human action is that um, you employ certain 
what Mises, the Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, calls yeah. scarce means. You employ these scarce means, or you could think of them as material resources or scarce resources. You employ them to change the events of the world, and those means include your human body and effort that you, that you put out combined with things that you use like tools right, or objects. Sure. And because these things extend the range of your effort, they are a property of you. That's why we started using the word property. So the first thing I would say is let's be careful about the word property because if you use it a little bit indiscriminately, then the question starts becoming is that property, is that property, is that property, and then who owns it without first asking is that the thing you're referring to, the type of entity or object that ought to be the subject of property rights in the first place. So for example, if you see a runaway black man in 1825 in the US, your question might be whose property is that, right? Right. But you know, the first question would be: There's a human being who owns his body, presumptively. Um, who's the owner of that person? It's it's him. Why should someone else be the property, uh, the owner of, of that property? Um, now, I would say that property rights refer to exclusive rights of control recognized by an established legal system in a given society, and the legal system does not have to be um, a state. Or government-based legal system. It can be just conventional or customary or anarchistic, um, sure. just in general terms, theoretically. Um, it's the recognized right to control a scarce resource, which is a means of action. So property really in the economic sense refers to anything that is a scarce means of action, something that we need as human actors to, to, to employ to get what we want. So typically that would include our human bodies, which is one special type of scarce resource or property, some people would say, and any other external resource in the world that is usable to accomplish an end and that was previously unowned. And if it was previously unowned, then someone can be the first one to use it and thereby establish a prior claim or a better claim than anyone else who comes after um, except for someone that they contractually transfer that thing to. So in a way, I, I, with this very – Simple question. Um, it, it unpacks a lot of the the essence and elements of libertarianism and the Austrian political theory. Okay. Um, now, from more of a uh, historical perspective, I guess, how did these notions relating to property rights uh, be begin to transfer over into uh, creative works and into a more uh, intellectual sense, I guess? How, how did that uh, develop? You, you have a, a way of asking extremely short, simple questions that <laughs> would take three hours to answer. Um, it's a good question. Um, here, here's my – and by the way, what I'm telling you is my particular perspective on things, and right. that's why you asked me. But I don't pretend that I am stating the uniform or the universal view that everyone holds. This is my perspective on things, so I'll be upfront about that. Um, okay. If there's something that's generally accepted, I'll, I'll let I'll 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 try to to indicate that. Okay, yeah, and um, and, I, and I want your personal view on, on these things. So my and this is my personal view that I've developed after about 30 years of thinking about this and and uh, having an initial set of views, and they refine, and then you think about where they came from and what makes sense, and then why did people go astray? Why did they come up with these terms? So this is what I, what I've kind of come to. Um, First of all, I think property rights as a system is a natural institution of human society. Um, it, it's even natural in non-humans. I mean even a dog um, will growl when – if you approach them when they're munching at their meal. Right? There's sort of an innate sense of, of po possession and not only possession of this material object, this means, this scarce resource, but the kind of right to control it like – the, the first dog there, there's an assumption that he has the better control over it. That's why the others right. back off. Um, now, that's not a perfect analogy. But humans, I think, because we're social creatures, because of the way we've evolved and human cultures developed, um, our natural values are very social. We value each other. We have empathy for each other. Um, there is a value to being part of society. There's also a value to uh, participating in the division of labor and in being recognized socially as having a reputation for being someone who 
um, is going to be a reciprocator, right? Someone who respects rights sure. as long as people respect their rights. Now, you could say, well, why not just be um, a cheater? The problem is we, we have minds and we live by concepts and we live by principles, and it's not easy to live in an ad hoc fashion all the time. And people do tend to know each other's characters, and and they that's why reputations matter and are useful and develop. Uh, and therefore, there is an incentive or a reason why actually just adhering to certain principles and having certain integrity and have a certain character um, makes sense, which is why I think overall most people tend to be civilized and respect rights and and want to have some kind of system of rules that are socially recognized that we can all agree to and abide by uh, that allows society to function and allows us to all be better off. So I think that's the general context of why these property rules arise. Yes, they have arisen primarily and largely in a governmental context, um, and I don't think that's necessary, but that's just the the, the way it's it's happened. Um, they've also arisen in a context where there's always a small number of people who will who will deviate and will be criminals, um, and we accept that. That's like insu- it's almost like an insurance type of of, of calculation. We recognize that. Um, there are going to be some cheaters, some malefactors, some bad guys, and then we come up with institutions to deal with them as well. So then the question is what rules are going to naturally emerge and that people would would adopt? And I think it's basically the ones we mentioned already. It's the first possession because that's the natural way to figure out who owns something or actually current possession. Whoever currently owns something is sort of like initially presumed to have the default right to control it. Uh, unless you could show that they had taken it from someone else, in which case then it goes back to a more deeper question, who who had first acquired it and then had been robbed of the, of the item, with some supplementary rules about contract and things like that. Sure. So that is the basic underpinning of the entire Western and indeed universal uh, reason around the world and in human history why there's always been a prohibition against theft. And there's always been some kind of dim recognition of, of self-ownership rights, at least for certain people, um, and why uh, murder has always been considered to be a crime and wrong. Um, the basic notion is that we need rules that allow us to live in peace with each other and cooperatively and use these resources that are scarce uh, productively without having to fight over them all the time, and the rules that… People tend to adopt or the Lockean rules, the rules that uh, are laid out by John Locke. Now, you asked about creativity and ideas. So here's where I think um, how we've arrived at the current situation. The current situation, just in brief, is that uh, we have an overly legalistic understanding of what rights are. It's overly legally positivistic. That is, everyone thinks of law now as what the, the government legislature decrees in, in statutory form. So if you say, show me the law, you want to see a written law issued by a legislature. Now, this is one type of law. It didn't used to be the dominant type of law, and I don't think it's a legitimate type of law at all. But the point is that everyone now thinks of law as as the, the decrees of a branch of a government. And today, a democratic, socialist kind of Western type government, right, with a part of the parliament or a Congress, an executive branch, you know, a legislative branch, and a judiciary. Um, that's how people think of what law and what it is. Okay. Um, now, uh, so so back to Locke. Locke was trying to come up with a justification for this kind of basic natural state of laws. The basic idea that you know, if you acquire a resource that was previously unowned, you have a better claim to it than someone else. That's sort of the essence of the Western property idea, the essence of libertarianism, the essence of all legal systems. I mean the details are interesting, but that's the basic idea. Now Locke was responding to a guy named Filmer who was sort of defending the um, – um, the feudalist system, and Filmer was trying to argue that, look, God and everyone had to agree with God because this was you know right, two right. three hundred years ago. So even Adam, uh, uh, so even Locke didn't deny that premise. But so Filmer was like, God owns the world and he gave it to his creation, which was Adam, the first man, 
and Adam owned the entire world and was able to transfer it to his descendants, which justified the monarchies or the feudalistic system, you see. And so Locke wanted to get away from that. He wanted to defend um, um, a more individualist, decentralized perspective. So he said, no, no, God gave the world to man in commons, which to our mind means unowned. Okay, in commons, unowned, sort of the same okay. idea. And therefore, as long as it's unowned or unused, the first guy that comes along and starts using it is the owner. Now, why? Because he owns himself. Now, he bases this upon you know God gives everyone a propriety in their, their own body. Again, the word propriety is used as a relationship or a right between the person and the material resource of his body. The body is not his property. It's a property of himself, or there's a pr proprietarian relationship. Okay, so you own your body, according to Locke, or yourself, as he calls it, somewhat metaphorically. And therefore, you own your labor, things that you do with your body. And therefore, you own unowned things or things in the commons that are not previously used by someone else that you mix your labor with. So this is where the labor idea comes into the picture. It comes into the picture with Locke's kind of metaphorical, quasi-religious argument in defense of – or in, in response to feudalism. Okay. Now I think that's where the – that was a mistake, and that's where the mistake set in. Now what it – and I'll explain in a second why I think it's a mistake, but what the mistake led to was this modern notion of intellectual property. Okay. Basically, it, it unmoored the question of property from the simple question of if we find a scarce resource that is something that two or more people can have a conflict over. Okay, If we find a resource like that and there's a conflict and we need to decide who owns it, we can, we can answer that question by resort to the basic questions of first possession, contract, maybe tort, but very simple questions. Okay, So the question is always for the libertarian, for the propertarian libertarian. Identify a scarce resource that is possibly in dispute, and then answer the question, who has the property right in it? That's the question. The question is not what is property or is that property. But from the locking point of view, you got you, – you, we were unmoored from that anchor because of this labor issue. So then it became an analogy type of argument or an overly metaphorical argument. So the analogy is, well, we all sort of know intuitively – you know. Our concepts aren't really well developed. We all we know intuitively that if I build a farm on an unused piece of ground, that I am the owner of that. And if I have bred these cows, I'm the owner of that. Or if I've raised these crops, I'm the owner of that. Or if I've made an axe out of steel that I found, or an iron ore that I, I I found, I'm the owner of that. And that's all true. But what the reasoning was was, well, why are these things more valuable than they were before? Well, because I labored on them, and I own myself, and I own my labor, so it's sort of this combination, and that's not actually incorrect, I think. It's just overly metaphorical and not precise, and it can lead you into error as I'm about to try to demonstrate. So the idea is that I, I own my body. I own my labor, whatever that means, and I, I therefore own the increased value of these natural resources that I homesteaded. Okay. So then they said, well, by analogy or, or maybe by induction, they said, well, the general principle here is that you own the, the fruits of your labor. You'll hear this expression a lot, the fruits okay. of your labor. Now, in the law, the word fruit simply means um, the result of something. In fact, in, in the civil law, the, the second great legal system in the world, uh, if you make interest on a loan, it's called civil fruits. Okay. A natural fruit would be you know, the, the calf of a cow or the actual fruit falling from a tree, right. and the idea is that if you own the tree, you own the fruit falling from it, natural fruit. If you own a cow, you own the calf that comes from the cow, natural fruit. If you have a piece of capital that you can invest and get rent on or interest on, the interest is the civil fruits, and you own that because you own the resource, and I think that's all true. But the reasoning is not correct. The reason that I own the, the fruit from the tree is because I own the tree. It's not because as a general principle that you own the results of things that you own. But if you, 
if you make that inductive argument, then you get to the point that we've gotten to now. Then you get to the argument that, well, just as I labor on the fields to produce crops and I, quote, therefore own the results of my labor, there's a general principle at work here, and that's that I own the results of my labor. And in fact, John Locke said that we own our bodies and we own our labor, therefore we own the results of our labor. Now, fast forward to the modern world where we have uh, technology, high technology, now software, computers, international commerce and trade, and a widespread recognition of the value of commerce, free markets, international trade, technology, and so on. And a widespread understanding that labor is not just physical labor. Labor can be intellectual and it can be mental, and you can produce great things with your mind or with mental efforts. So all these ideas blend together to lead people to assume that just as the product of your labor in a physical sense, like a farmer owning a field, um, ought to be subject to property rights… Therefore, the product of your labor in a mental sense ought to be subject to property rights. And this has resulted in being – this has been used as a justification for various intellectual property regimes, most of which have been legislated. The, the two primary ones are patent and copyright. Um, trademark and trade secret are also important. For the software context, I think probably um, copyright is the most important. Patent is probably number two, and trade secret is, is, is somewhat used as well. Um, um, so that's what has happened. Um, actually, in fact, I think that these legal systems, especially patent and copyright, originated for totally different reasons than we understand now, and these justifications were given after the fact. So uh, copyright arose out of the desire of the church and the state in their unholy alliance to control thought, to censor speech, to prevent the… Um, unauthorized spread of ideas by the Gutenberg printing press that the church and state didn't want spread. Um, so this was originated from a system of state control. It's basically control of thought and censorship, and it still results in that today, by the way. Um, after the fact, it became regularized and institutionalized and co-opted by the Stationers Guild and the, the publishing monopolies and all this, and then when people start criticizing it… Then they say, well, we know that there are natural rights based upon labor and all this, so they kind of come up with an ad after the fact justification. Patents were uh, similarly not the result of anything like Locke's original theory. In fact, Locke did not agree that his homesteading idea justified intellectual property rights. He, he, he agreed that they were just um, temporary civil measures the government could undertake to… To promote some kind of um, activity in the economy, so he didn't think there were natural rights, nor did the American founders, by the way. Um, they were not viewed as property rights, which is why they only last a finite amount of time. Right? Patents last right. roughly 17 years. Copyrights around 100 plus years. Um, if they were real natural property rights, they would last forever. Right? So the patent monopoly originated back in the practice of the monarchs, the king, the crown. Granting um, basically protectionist uh, monopolies to various favored court cronies and other people. So one guy gets the right to sell playing cards or export sheepskin or whatever in a given region, and in exchange he grants loyalty or maybe even helps to the king or maybe even helps the king collect taxes. So it was basically a grant of protectionism and monopolies, which is why the very first patent statute, 1723 – in England is called the statute of monopolies. I mean, no one – this is really <laughs> wow. not disputed. It was you know, <laughs> statute of monopolies. Okay. So, and then after the fact, you know, the people trying to justify these provisions. So basically 1700s, this was becoming more regular in England. And when the US was founded, 1789, the um, the framers put copyright and patent into the constitution as powers Congress had. Right. Okay. They didn't really give it a lot of thought. They didn't give. It, I mean, I think they were going by mostly by inertia and partly by self-interest. A lot of them had, you know, these are the most educated people at the time, so these are going to be the guys that are the authors. So they have some interest. They were the most intelligent guys. Some of them are going to be the most prolific inventors. Jefferson, you know, Ben Franklin, etc. So you could see why they would put that provision in the Constitution. Um, 
they didn't have any empirical studies showing it was legitimate. Um, they didn't um, have a theory that of why it was legitimate. Um, but so these systems got started, and then then you have copyright and patent battles start happening in the ensuing decades. The economists becoming increasingly free market in Europe and the U.S. start going. These are protectionist measures by the state, which are contrary to the free market and to individual property rights and human freedom. So there was a huge backlash and a huge battle, and in response, by now there had been vested interests who had risen up who were dependent upon copyright like the publishing industry and patent like various uh, centralized corporations and um, you know companies like this. Sure. So they start mounting a rear guard defense, and their defense is… Well, it's really a natural right. It's a type of property right. It's part of commerce. It's part of capitalism. How dare you? What you're? Are you against innovation? Are you against creativity, etc.? You know, forgetting the fact that patent law originally stifled innovation and still does, and forgetting that copyright originated in the attempt to stifle free thought and free freedom of expression. Um, so I think that's what happened. I think the fundamental mistake was. And I don't blame Locke for this. He did a great job at the time, but I think I do think it was a misstep. Um, David Hume, who came later, himself recognized that Locke's argument is good and sufficient without that unnecessary step. And by that step, I mean the the, the step that you own your body, therefore you own your labor, therefore you own what you mix it with. Um, first of all, as, as as Hume pointed out. Saying that you own your labor is is overly metaphorical. It's vague. Um, you might as well say you own your action, which is what Mises would call labor is a type of action. And to say you own your action is sort of a weird expression. It's in, in my view, it's double counting. It's double counting because you're saying that you have the right to own your body and you have the right to own your action. But my thinking is that if you own your body, that gives you the right to act as you right. please. Yes. Um, it's like saying you have a right to your body and a right to privacy and a right to free speech. I'm like, well, there's no such thing as a right to free speech per se. There's a right to do as you please as long as you're not committing aggression. Right. And if you have the right to own private property like a home or a venue, you can say whatever you want within that venue, or you could own a printing press. Private property rights give you the right to own a printing press, which gives you the right to… Sell a book, but it would be double counting to say you have a right to own a printing press and the right to sell books. It's like, well, one, the first one is sufficient to cover the second. Okay, it's okay to look at the benefits of these rights. Um, so I think that this this sort of imprecision in thinking. Um, um, so it's, it's, it, to get back to Hume, so Hume said that Locke's argument works if you take out that step, and I agree with that. If you basically say, yes, I own my body. Now, why do I own my body? Well, you can believe you own your body because God gave it to you. I guess that means you're really God's slave, but compared to everyone else, you own your body. Right. Or you could believe you own your body because you are the one that directly controls it. You have a better claim to it than anyone else, unless you commit a crime, which might change the presumption. But the default state is you own your body. Now, why would I be… Who would be the owner of some object, some external resource that's not a human body and not a living actor with, with, a, with a property right in itself? Um, it would have to be the first user because if it wasn't the first user, you could never have a first user. In other words, no one would ever be able to go use a resource as unowned um, if, if, if they weren't going to have the, the best claim to it. If, if the first guy that uses a resource is not the best claimant, then… The second guy who takes it from him doesn't have a right to keep a third person from taking it from him, which means we don't have property rights at all, which, mean we're living, which means we're living by a tooth and claw. We're living by the law of the jungle. We're living in a mites makes right situation, and we're not talking about ethics and norms and rules anymore at all anyway. If you're going to have rules and norms, as far as I can see, the only justified set would be the Lockean um, – the Lockean set. So I do think that there was a big misstep there. I think Locke did not need to say that we own our labor, and he didn't need to say that we own things because we mix we mix our labor with them um, that we own. He just needed to say that the first user of a resource has a presumptive better claim than anyone else, and that would have avoided this entire 
false direction we've taken with defamation law, reputation rights, that is, trademark, patent, copyright, uh, and even some aspects of trade secret law. Okay. Um, now, one of the, the things you mentioned in there was uh, how these uh, laws stifle innovation and creativity. Yes. And obviously, uh, you, you explained that uh, – you explained why that is to, to an extent in there. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the, the general consensus seems to be that these laws are, are necessary yes. for creativity and innovation. Yes. Uh, so how, how did that uh, consensus arise? And uh, what are some, uh, I guess, examples of, of that okay. playing out the way most sure. think it does? So what I think happened is, first of all, I think intellectual property, especially nowadays, uh, patent, patent and copyright, um, which I think have gotten to be a more significant part of the economy since the internet, okay, and since international trade a couple decades before that. Um, it's highly arcane, highly specialized, highly controlled by bureaucrats, judges, and lawyers and special interest groups who understand its workings, and it's extremely complicated. Um, so first of all, I think most people don't understand it, so they they um, they accept the common wisdom. They they they're in favor of innovation, and they're in favor of property rights, which is to their credit. I'm talking about like the average intelligent right. lady. Sure, sure. And they have heard that um, intellectual property is a type of property right. Well, number one, it's called a property right. It's called intellectual mm -hmm. property. It wasn't called that originally. Um, it was called patent monopolies and <laughs> statutes. Um, but then, in defense, uh, in response to the the attacks by free market economists, the um, the special interest groups started calling it intellectual property. So it was just a propaganda move. Um, so I think that the reason people believe this is because it's very complicated, very detailed. It requires a lot of economic understanding as well, and they have accepted the uh, propaganda that has been perpetrated by the by the state. Um, and by the special interests that do benefit, um, at least temporarily, from these government-granted um, uh, monopolies. Um, now, there are two main defenses of intellectual property given by its defenders. The primary one, which is rife nowadays, is a, a more of a utilitarian or empirical argument, um, which is the argument along the lines you suggested that um, innovation as a general thing which would include artistic creation and um, um, technical uh, findings, innovation, discovery, uh, or either necessary – I'm sorry, intellectual property is either necessary for this or at least that we, we have a lot more of it. We would have a deficit of it without intellectual property law. Um, the second argument is more of a natural rights one, no, which is that you, because you create something, you have the right to own it. Now, as I've mentioned, I think that the second argument is pretty easily dispatched with. Right. Um, it's, too many of these arguments of the latter type are almost semantic. It's almost like saying it's arguing by possessive. Uh, if if I have if, if that's my wife, well, I must own her because the word my is possessive. You know, I mean, you right. you can you can make these simplistic arguments, and they do this all the time. And the the proponents of IP, I think, are pretty much. Um, um, pretty much unprincipled and dishonest, and they will switch back and forth. Um, you take your typical patent lawyer, which I'm a patent lawyer, and most of my fellow ilk are fav in favor of patent law, big surprise. But almost none of them have a good argument for it. Right. One reason is there's no good argument for it. <laughs> Number two is they don't, they don't care. They just want to keep the money flowing. Sure. So they will just say what they need to say to shut the argument, you know, to stop any kind of measure blocking them and to keep things going. Um, the first argument is empirical, and I don't want to be too critical of empiricism and utilitarianism. Um, it, there's a pragmatic aspect to it, a consequentialist aspect. The idea is that in general, property rights laws that we favor have good consequences, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing. Um, so let's just break the argument down into two types. Number one, the argument which you kind of summarized earlier. Um, innovation is impossible without intellectual property law, or there would be no innovation without IP law. It's really hard to make that argument, and no one seriously tries to make it. Um, right. 
you really cannot argue that if we abolish patent law tomorrow, there would never be any more innovation in the history of mankind. No one, no one really believes that. There would still be some, right? So instead, their argument is that we would have less. Okay. So what that means is they're imagining that there's some optimal or higher amount of innovation that we could have if we just change the law in this way. So they really are just tinkering in the economy, right? They're they're social policy um, tinkerers. They want to adjust the levers of policy to maximize um, innovation or to at least improve innovation a significantly large amount that the value of which to society is much greater than the cost. Because I think if you're an honest empirical advocate of IP, which I think most people are, they just don't know what they're talking about. I think that's their, their motivation. I think if you said, listen, if patent law – cost a trillion dollars a year in cost on innovation, but it only resulted in $200 billion more additional innovation. It's not worth it, right? They would agree with that. So their implicit assumption is the opposite of the case. Okay. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when the founders of the US in 1789 adopted the Patent and Copyright Clause, they didn't have any empirical studies demonstrating anything. Okay. So it was sort of a hunch. Let's just sure. say it was a hunch. Let's give them the benefit sure. of the doubt. But we've had 200 plus years of fancy uh, uh, econometrics and empirical studies, especially in the last 70 years. And you would think by now, if they're right, there would be some kind of clear empirical evidence showing that patent laws massively uh, benefit the economy. So my first response to your question about the empirical claim is that the burden of proof is on them to show it, and by now right. they should have been able to show it, right. but they haven't. All the studies are either – are either uh, they say we can't figure it out. It's too messy, which is not surprising because value is not really measurable, <laughs> um, um, or they conclude that from what we can tell in this sector of the economy… Copyright law or patent law causes a huge multi-billion dollar deadweight loss. Okay, I'm just talking about what the studies show. Right. So even in 2014, today, right, 120 or so, 220 or so years after the founding, we still don't have any kind of clear um, showing um, that the empirical case for IP is justified. Now, you will hear dishonest, disingenuous, offhand arguments like, well, the U.S. has been the most prosperous and most technologically advanced country for the last 200 years, and we've had IP rights since the beginning, so therefore IP rights must be the cause of that. Now, in my view, that's just a very simplistic argument which confuses causation with correlation or vice versa. Sure. You, could, you could also argue that because we've had tariffs or – a war about every decade since 1789 uh, or slavery for the first hundred years. That's why we succeeded. I mean, th these are their correlations, but they're not causation. In fact, I view, I believe that it's the other way around. So now why would, why would patents cause um, retard innovation? Well, one reason patents would retard innovation um, is that anyone seeking to compete with someone to make a similar product, let's say Samsung wanting to make an, something like an iPhone, if they make it too similar, which is what it means to compete, um, they're going to get sued for patent infringement, and they know this. Okay, And so a lot of com companies never even do it in the first place, which means they never engage in the innovative activities um, that they would have engaged in to improve the product or to morph it. So there's lost innovation there. You know, Bastiat and Hazlitt talked about the seen and the unseen. Yeah. We can see the benefits of some policies. If there's a food stamp program, we see someone who can buy food now, but we don't see the harm that's done to someone who had to pay the taxes for the food stamp. And so that the, the cost of that policy is unseen. And I think that's largely the case with innovation. Um, you know, people can point people who are advocates of government funding of innovation uh, can point to Tang. You know, they can say, well, you know, we have billions of dollars spent by NASA on moon missions, and one result was Tang. You know, Tang might be fine, might be a great innovation. It was popular for about three years, as I remember <laughs> in the 70s. 
but that doesn't show that the money that was spent as a developing Tang and other things for astronauts um, couldn't have been invested better um, better elsewhere. Another example is that um, a lot of companies have to engage in a lot of money to what they call design around a patent. So if you or if you're aware of a patent out there, which takes money to be aware of in the first place, you have to hire patent lawyers like me just to research this and search it and educate you on this. Then you have to make a decision about what kind of product can we make that's going to be popular, that's different enough from this other product that we don't get sued, which means you put features into your product that you wouldn't naturally have done, Okay, which means it's less efficient than it would have otherwise been, which means there's a cost, which means there's a waste. Um, and when there's a waste, there's less innovation, right? Um, uh, because there's less resources around to stimulate the innovation. That's another example. So patents actually distort the entire process of innovation and research and development um, in various ways. So one way is that patents are awarded for practical applications of abstract ideas, but not for the abstract ideas themselves. So, for example, Einstein could not have gotten a patent on e equals mc squared, okay? But someone who took that formula – and used it to develop a transistor or maybe a, you know something else could have gotten a patent on it. So what this does is it leads to a distorting effect in in science and industry where the more abstract fields are less rewarded and the more practical applications are more rewarded. So what you have is a government pushing one over the other. Now you could argue that one is better than the other. But there's no reason to believe that the government's decision is right, and the government artificially distorting the economy and this, you know, the, the technology arena um, is a good thing. Government distortion usually means government is destroying value. So those are just a couple of examples. There are um, – um, another example is if you think about the Samsung, say, Apple patent wars. Okay, What you have is you have a, couple, a few very small – a small number of large players like Apple, Samsung, um, Motorola, and others, and they're the manufacturers of, say, smartphones. There's other examples in other industries like chemicals or laser printers or whatever. But the reason there's only a small number of players, the reason it's like a car cartel or cartelized industry is because only these big players have the resources to acquire vast arsenals of patents… That they can use as bargaining chips with each other when they sue each other. So, you know, if um, Apple sues um, uh, Samsung or Motorola or Google, the other guys can fight back with their own patents. They can spend fifty million dollars a year on their lawyers' fees, and eventually they come to a settlement, which the shareholders suffer in the cost uh, of uh, you know reduced returns, and the price of cell phones goes up by a few percent. And the customers have no choice but to buy an Apple or a Motorola or a Samsung, but the price is five dollars, ten dollars higher, so they're paying these fees in effect. But they have a limited choice because you have an oligopoly or a cartel because small players can't enter the field. If you wanted to start a, a mobile smartphone startup tomorrow, you're invariably bound to violate some of the patents of these big players, and you won't be able to defend yourself. You won't be able to afford… Three million dollars of patent lawyer fees just to defend yourself, especially when you'd probably lose because patents are legitimate. I mean, they actually will be enforced quite often. So it results in reduced competition, cartelized, oligopolized industries, which have a lower incentive to innovate because they don't have as many people to compete with. They can rest on their laurels. So there's lots of reasons to believe that any Reduction of wealth, which is a result of any government program um, or action, or any uh, reduction in competition, which is the reduction of a lot of government laws, um, especially any government meddling with the technological sector of the economy, is always going to reduce innovation and overall consumer welfare and wealth and freedom. And this is exactly what the patent system has done, and the copyright system… Um, has resulted in reduction of freedom and wealth in other ways as well. Okay. Um, now, have the uh, trademark or trade secret systems uh, had similar effects? Uh, I, I guess those are more done uh, at a state level. 
right, uh, than, than a federal level in the United States. Well, here, here, here's how I'd rank them. Um, I think that the copyright system, I think the patent system is the worst in terms of dollar amounts. I, I, my suspicion is the patent system probably imposes half a trillion dollars a year or more on the worldwide economy or, or maybe more um, because of reduced innovation and um, uh, related effects. It's primarily – it's like a huge tax on growth and technology. The copyright system probably doesn't impose that much in dollar terms, but it has heavily distorted the culture, um, the way we think about consuming music and media. Um, and, but it's, it's, it's even worse than patent, I believe, because it's the biggest threat to internet freedom because it's being used by the state as an excuse to increase controls on how people uh, trade information on the internet. Because of copyright piracy, so you have the Stop Online Piracy Act. You have uh, upcoming treaties like the Transatlantic uh, Transatlantic Pacific Partnership (TPP). Right. Um, things like this that are coming that that are serious serious challenges to internet freedom, and I think that's so important because internet freedom is so important for liberty and to fight the state. Right. And and so copyright to me is one of the biggest threats um, we have out there. Um, it's being used along with uh, pornography, terrorism, um, gambling, money laundering, all these state regulations, which are excuses the state uses to shut websites down or to go after people for just exchanging information on the internet, Bitcoin now. But copyright's one of the biggest, probably the biggest in my view. Uh, so those are the two big looming problems. Um, I would say so. If you want to put like copyright here, you know, patent here, and then trademark way down here, and trade secret way down here. Um, trade secret is largely state in the U.S. state level law. It's developed out of the common law, but to my mind, even that's unjust because you don't really need the government to, to give you permission to keep something secret. Right. <laughs> you, right. you can just keep it secret. Right. The only part of trade secret law that is, goes beyond that is that the government says that if you can prove you made a diligent effort to keep something secret and someone still leaks the information, then you can go to a government court and get a court order, an injunction against third parties, people who had no contract with you whatsoever, and the government can the government court can tell them um, on pain of being in jail for contempt of court that they have to keep secret and not use this information. So I think it's totally unjust. I think that um, if you have no contract with someone and you didn't steal the information or you didn't break into someone's property to get the information, if you stumble across information, then the government has no right to tell you not to use it. Um, the person that has the secret should have been more careful with it. And if they're not, right. too bad. But it's not a big problem. There's a couple of notorious examples. I think Apple uh, – remember when the iPhone 4S or something was left accidentally on a bar stool? In Silicon Valley, by one of the employees testing it when it was still secret, and someone found it and started posting photos about it on the internet. Well, Apple's lawyers and the police showed up at this guy's house the next day um, under the guise of trade secret law, demanding to search the apartment and to take this iPhone. Okay. Um, so, to my mind, even trade secret law can lead to sort of Quasi police state protectionist tactics, although I don't think it's a big, a big problem or a big factor. Trademark law is in between. Trademark law used to be a, a common law, state law based thing primarily, and it was said to be based upon a combination of two things. Number one, the right to your reputation, which I think is a type of IP right based on this Lockean labor idea. If you build up your reputation with the consumers. You have a right to it, and this is linked in with this economic or financial concept of goodwill. You know, they always kind of put this factor in the gap hmm. charts about uh, how much of your business is this, this, where's the rest? Well, it's in goodwill, <laughs> whatever that is. Um, okay, so th that's one part of it, uh, which I think is wrong, but again, it's not that harmful. Um, and the second part is um, they say that well, it, it's it's a way of preventing consumers from being defrauded. So if if one of my competitors starts using my logo. In a deceptive manner, it could defraud consumers, and we all agree that's bad, and I agree that's bad because I'm a libertarian, and fraud is one thing that we agree is a species or a type of aggression. You, you can't defraud someone. However, the trademark law, even in the common law system, even in the state law system, 
uh, and it's much worse now, by the way. But even in the original system, never required the plaintiff in a trademark suit to prove fraud of a consumer. So it wasn't a, a, a part of the cause of action. You didn't have to show that the defendant was defrauding any actual person. But yet they use this fraud argument to justify why we have these laws. So they're having it both ways. What they had to show was a, a likelihood of consumer confusion. Okay, fine. I could live with that if I had to. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. It's like fraud. It's not exactly fraud. It's just sleazy, but okay. But number one, even that kind of trademark law has been and today is increasingly used um, to stifle free speech. It's used all the time by these companies. They will use trademark law. They'll throw that into their complaint letter. They'll get sites taken down or they'll sue people. They'll say, "What your complaint about my product was a violation of my trademark rights, even though you're not really con confusing any consumers or committing any kind of fraud. The worst thing about trademark law is that it has become federalized. There's something called the Lanham Act. I think it's passed in the 50s. It was a federal version of trademark. Um, because trademark is not in the, that constitutional clause I mentioned earlier, right. patent and copyright are, um, the federal government had to find another – source of authority to justify legislating in the realm of um, of trademark. And by the way, they've also legislated in the realm of trade secret. There's the right, um, right. there's a theft of trade secrets um, provision, which is a federal law, which makes it a federal crime to commit certain types of trade secret theft. But anyway, the Lanham Act basically only federalizes trademark law to the extent that we're talking about a mark used in interstate commerce. So that's why there's still now there's a system of state trademark systems in in harmony with the federal system. In Europe, there's a similar thing with the European Union, and you know, it's, it's it's all over the map. Um, whereas there's no really state patent or co or copyright law systems uh, that I'm aware of. It's all federal. So the state the state federal trademark act originally was just a federal version of this common law version, but in the meantime, they've added. Um, Anti in the 1990s, I think under under Clinton, they added the um, anti dilution requirement, which says that there's a new trademark right, which is that you not only have the right as the owner of a trademark to have someone not infringe your trademark by using the mark in a way that's likely to 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 uh, to confuse consumers, you also have a right not to have your mark tarnished. Or diluted, the value of it diluted. So you see, it goes back to this Lockheed stuff. The, so the idea is that you have a, the right to the value of the mark, and if someone reduces the value of your mark by their actions, they pro violated your property rights. Um, and dilution has nothing whatsoever to do um, with um, with with consumer confusion or fraud whatsoever. But you'll talk to libertarians. Or free market types, and they'll say, "Well, you you got if you're against trademark law, you're against fraud, even though the trademark law is not rooted in fraud um, at all." Let me let me give give you one colorful, interesting example. Okay, um, sure. a, a few years ago, this is more of a copyright case, but it's an example of how um, companies will use these things. Um, um, Omega, you know, the watchmaker, you know, yeah, the one James, yeah, sure. the one James Bond likes. Um, they. Um, they sell these watches that are extremely expensive. I can't remember the numbers, but let's say it's a $15,000 watch in the U.S. Well, they, they sell it in other markets too, and um, um, they were selling it in one of these South American countries um, for a significantly smaller, lower price because just of price discrimination, right? Because they knew they couldn't get as much for, let's say, 6000 So you had some entrep you know, enterprising arbitrageur, right? He would go down there to, to – um, to South America, and he would buy the watch. It's a legitimate watch. It's not a bootleg. It's not a knockoff. And he would, and or, or, actually, it was Costco doing this. I don't remember if he sold it to Costco or Costco did it directly. But anyway, Costco was selling these Omega watches in their U.S. stores for a significant discount from the from the local Omega stores because they were getting them from the retailer in South America. So what Costco did was they they couldn't stop it because it wasn't. A copyright or patent or trademark infringement because it was a, a legitimate sale. It was it was it was a legitimately sold watch by them. They really couldn't complain how the owner used it after that, right? And we have free trade, so it could be sold here. So what they did was they inscribed this little globe symbol 
they had they hired an artist to, to make a globe like a map and they put a little globe symbol on the back of it now guess what the globe is subject to copyright okay so then they took costco to court and they won on, on the grounds that the so-called first sale doctrine of copyright doesn't kick in if the first sale isn't within the territorial borders of the U.S. because the U.S. law is only domestic and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> so that's one example. A more recent example was um, this Wiley and Sons case. I don't know if you heard about this one. Um, no, I you had this, not. So Wiley is a big academic publisher. So they sell textbooks here for you know to students for hundreds right. of bucks a book, and they sell them in I can't remember what, some some Asian country, Vietnam or somewhere. For like maybe one fourth or one fifth as much, and on cheaper paper too. But it was the same book, and you had this student who was over here, an Asian student, and he would get his relatives to buy the books and send them over here, and he would sell them over here. He was making hundreds of thousands a year just on the arbitrage, and he was not in violation of copyright. Well, you would think he wasn't because these are not knockoffs; they're not bootlegs. Same same thing happened, you know. Uh, I think it's called Kurt Sang in this case. So these are examples of how these laws will be used and have been used routinely. Um, and trademark law and patent law are used like this all the time as well to stop free trade, to impede progress. Uh, in in the U.S. case, um, I mean, in the in the in the in the in the patent case, um, something similar happens with uh, drug reimportation. So you'll have Bayer, one of these big companies, big pharmaceutical companies, sells a version of their drug in Canada, and they're sold at a much lower price, mostly because Canada imposes price controls because they're more socialist right. in some ways than we are. Well, those are legitimate products, and the owner can do what they want, and they, there's a practice of reimporting them down here. So of course the big drug companies get the uh, Federal Trade Commission to intervene and say, well, you can't import this, or maybe it's the FDA. I can't keep it straight even you have to, <laughs> food drug, to say that, well, you're selling a drug here that's not approved by the FDA. It's like, well, it is approved by the FDA. It's the same company. It's approved in the U.S. You're selling it in Canada. So then they say, well, it's an FTC issue. It's a trade issue. It's like, well, we have free trade. <laughs> so so, so you had actually libertarian – this is about 10 years ago, eight, eight, nine years ago. This dispute broke out. You actually had libertarians at the Cato Institute, which is normally free trade libertarian, like Roger uh, – I can't remember uh, – Doug Bandow, uh, Richard Epstein, okay. arguing that the federal government in the U.S. should not allow drug reimportation of, of, of this kind of uh, drugs because it's a way of doing an end run around the patents. So you basically have the IP patent system being used even by proponents of free trade as an excuse to limit free trade. <laughs> so you can see the t tension there, the conflict. You've got to really choose, in my opinion. You have to choose. Do you want competition? Do you want people to learn? Do you want them to be able to emulate what they learn and what they see? Um, um, and do you want private property rights and individual liberty? Or do you want a cartelized, government-manipulated and distorted system of protectionism and thought control and control of the internet and free speech? I think – that's the choice we have to make. Okay. Now, um, uh, and this question, I guess, is more uh, as an aside. It's not directly related to uh, what I was planning to discuss, but you mentioned it in passing a little bit, so I, I thought I, uh, sure. I'd ask it anyways. Um, you, uh, when you were discussing trademark, you, you talked about uh, fraud and, and that argument that uh, – Goes along with that as as being fraud uh, when trademarks uh, when trademark laws need to be enforced or or, or when when uh, people are attempting to enforce them. Um, so uh, the term fraud seems to get get thrown around a lot uh, without really uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm opening up a can of worms that that uh, can no, be it's, discussed it's a, on end for hours. Simple. But yeah. it's but a pretty it's, simple one. It's uh it it's never really been. Uh, well, at least I've never really heard it fleshed out in, in, in uh, detail exactly what is fraud and what isn't fraud. No, you're completely right. This is I, I just had a, a, a Tom Woods podcast where I was yeah. trying to go through some of these things the other day. Yeah, I, I, um, and I listened to that, and I was really hoping that you would discuss fraud in particular. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we I don't think we got fraud. into it. I, I yeah. did have a couple of other longer talks I've given where I did go into it in more detail, but okay. quickly. Um, this is another one of those terms that can that, that you have to be try to be precise about. It's used in a variety of ways. Most people think of fraud as some kind of deceitful activity or some kind of shadiness or dishonesty. Um, 
another one on an aside is the word plagiarism, which they sometimes conflate with each other. But you'll hear people say if you're not against co- if you're not for copyright, then you're for plagiarism. So they're doing exactly what for the copyright case um, with the plagiarism idea, what people do with trademark and the fraud idea. They will get you to admit that as a human being, you think there's something wrong with plagiarism, and then they will um, they'll they'll equate that with something that's embodied in the copyright statute. And if you're against copyright law, then you're you're for plagiarism. But then they don't insist on plagiarism being part of the copyright standard. Um, plagiarism and copyright have almost nothing to do with each other. One's a type of dishonesty, taking credit for something you didn't do, and the other is just reproducing patterns of information that you don't have the permission to reproduce. Um, uh, most cases of copyright infringement are not plagiarism at all. If I sell you a bootleg copy of the latest um, um, you know, Steven Spielberg movie, there's no plagiarism involved. I'm not pretending I'm Steven Spielberg. I don't put my name on the movie. Um, and most cases of plagiarism are not necessarily copyright. If I plagiarize um, a long excerpt from Aristotle in my class paper, I'm, I may be committing plagiarism, but there's no copyright involved because that's a public domain work. So these things are actually not related. In the fraud case, um, um, most human beings would say that dishonesty as a general thing is bad. Honesty is a virtue. I agree. Um also, it's wrong to steal from people. I agree. It's wrong to murder or attack people. Um, the only way you can make fraud a type of crime or call it a species of aggression or a type of aggression or the type of thing that the law is justified in prohibiting with the force of law is if you have a very clear understanding of the nature of property rights and the consequent nature of Contract. Okay. So property rights, as we discussed earlier, is means the legally recognized right to control a resource by a person who's seen as the owner. And actually, it could be defined more narrowly still. The right to control is really not the right to control. It's the right to exclude. It's the only it's only the right to keep people from using this resource. Doesn't mean you have the right to use it. Uh, in fact, that's Part of patent law too. Um, if you have a patent on, on an invention, it doesn't mean you have the right to use that invention. It only means you can stop people from doing it. Um, so the reason I say that is, like, let's say I own a gun. If I'm the owner of that gun, I can prevent you from using the gun if I want to, or I can permit you to use it. That's called license or permission. Um, or I could. So my permission could be temporary. It could be conditional. It could be limited. It could be unopen. It could be open. I could give you the gun as a gift, or I could sell you the gun in exchange for money. So there's various things I can do, um, but I don't have the right to shoot you with the gun um, if if you're not committing aggression against me. So merely having the right to gun doesn't mean I have the right to use it. It just means I have the right to do anything with it I would have the right to do with anything else so long as I'm respecting others' rights. Okay, So that's the basic idea of property rights. Contract flows from this. Contract is just the exercise of this right to grant permission or to deny permission of access um, of the owner. That's what a contract is. A contract is some kind of communicated assent or consent to someone else's – some type of use of, of an object that you have a property right in. That's what a contract is. Okay. Contract is not a binding promise, which is mo- what most people think of it as. And if you, so you first have to get contract rights clear. And Rothbard, Murray Rothbard, wrote clearly on this, and I think established a revolutionary new way of looking at contract rights. So once you understand that contract is just an implication of property rights, and property rights is the fundamental thing, then the question of fraud comes in. And to my mind, fraud, what people are getting at when they think of typical acts of fraud, and the reason why it could be classified as a type of Trespass or theft is because it's what I would call what what the, what the law calls a, a theft by trick. Okay, so imagine imagine you're going to have surgery and you give the doctor consent to take your appendix out. Okay, now you wake up and your appendix is removed. Now can you sue him for assault and battery? No. Why? Because you consented, right? But let's say your your foot is missing. <laughs> Now, 
he chopped your foot off. Now, did he commit aggression or assault and battery? I would say yes because you didn't consent to it. So then the question becomes what did you consent to? This is where this communication aspect comes in. It depends upon what a reasonable person thinks is actually being communicated between the parties. You're the owner of your body. What did you consent to? I consented to an appendicitis. I did not consent to um, an amputation of my foot. Okay, So it depends upon what the owner of a resource manifests as his consent to someone else. And this is what happens in any kind of transaction between people in the free market, a purchase, a sale, an exchange, etc. And this is where fraud can come in, in my view. Fraud is analogous to um, the case of the surgeon removing your foot when you didn't consent to it or when you gave um, uninformed consent, okay, depending on the circumstances. So an example of fraud would be um, I'm exchanging a basket of apples for your, for your chickens. Okay. Now, there's an implicit or maybe even explicit communication going there. My communication to you is – these are good apples. They're regular apples. You know, they're not made of lead or poisoned or full of bombs or whatever, um, to my knowledge. And I will transfer my my ownership of them to you if and when you transfer ownership of your chickens to me. And likewise, there's certain representations implicitly or explicitly being made by the chicken owner. So if I'm giving you rotten apples for your chickens knowingly doing this, then I know that you're saying you can have my chickens if you're giving me good apples. So your consent is like the consent to the surgery. It's like I said, um, I'm going to have surgery, and the doctor says, well, I'm going to do an appendicitis, but if I find a horribly cancerous legion on your heart while I'm in there – okay, not your heart. You're somewhere else near there. Right. Um, do I have your permission to remove it? And I say yes. And those conditions, yes, but I specify certain conditions. Well, you're doing the same with the chickens. You're saying, I'm giving you these chickens, but only if you're giving me real apples. You follow me? Yeah. So if I give you bad apples for the chicken and I take the chicken, now I've got possession of your property, and I'm using it without your authorized consent, without your informed – because I know that really the condition hasn't been satisfied. The condition was that I gave you good apples. And I'm knowingly violating that. So I am basically taking your your property, your your own resource without your consent. That's why it's a type of trespass. So fraud is simply a way of failing to meet a condition of a conditional transfer of, of property rights to an object. Okay. It's so not every form of dishonesty can do that. So let, let's say you meet a girl at a bar and you know. You know, she likes guys with black hair, and your hair is really blonde, but you have it dyed black, and you don't tell her that your hair is really blonde, right. and you, you use that to seduce her. Is that rape? No. She consented to the rape, and there's no, there's no exchange of title there actually, right? Or other forms of fraud like where you deceive someone into doing something or you're just a deceitful, dishonest person. Those are reprehensible bad actions, but they're just dishonesty. They're not – in the context of a transfer of title to property where you could somehow characterize it as theft by trick. So I think fraud has to be characterized as theft by some kind of theft by trick. Okay. And if you think of it that way, then it limits the scope of when fraud – and it also shows why fraud is a type of, of aggression. Right. Yes. It shows why, and it limits when it can be applied. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you for that explanation, and um... – Thank you for all your time. Uh, this uh, went longer than I anticipated, so thank you for being so generous uh, in your help. And, You're welcome. Uh, You're welcome. I, I enjoyed it. I I, uh, I encourage you to keep thinking like this. This is good. It's it's good that you do this. I commend you for that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, there's definitely a lot I can use for for this assignment. And there's also a lot that. Uh, uh, I hadn't thought of before that I didn't know before, so this is uh, it's been very valuable on on both of those accounts. So I I, I really uh, am grateful. So thank I you enjoyed very it. much. And yep. um, all right, take care. All right, good luck in your course. All right, thank you.